Uh, probably a month ago, I did a wedding here. Congratulations, Gridleys. I see you back there. And you're still married, right? It's kind of an embarrassing question, huh? Good. Wow, my, my record is intact. I'm, I'm uh, doing percentage-wise all right. In just a couple months, I'll do another one um, out in Jacksonville. And uh, I want to talk to you just for a minute. I talked to you about this probably six, seven years ago. And uh, it has become part of my wedding ceremonies at times when I want to preach to somebody a little more. And I did to the Gridleys uh, here. Um, and I've done it before. Um, where I talk about the difference between um, covenant versus contract thinking. And I want to talk, it, talk to you about it um, in Hebrews here. But I want to present to you just kind of some things that I talk about when it comes to a wedding. Um, and these are some big overall ideas, all right? So I realize that in the midst of when we talk wedding relationships, that there are circumstances um, where someone needs to get out, um, and that is a separate piece. I recognize that. Um, I'm talking about just kind of the overall big idea, and it really matters for us today. I'll talk to you about that in just a minute. This, this makes a difference in our lives and relationships and with God. Um, a, a covenant is this. You, you, this is not in your notes. That you, you have that, I believe, or in the beginning of your notes. You can write some things down that pop out to you. And maybe some discussion that we can't have this morning, but we can have another time or in your small groups about what it means concerning covenant and contract. You'll think of some things possibly. But a covenant basically is a sealed agreement between parties made binding by an oath or a promise. Um, in God's case, he established the terms. So when you think of covenant in the Bible, um, there's incredible studies on it. We'll talk about it some more. Um, and today we'll talk about the new covenant versus old covenant a little bit. But God has established the terms when it comes to covenant. A contract is an agreement that you will do um, with someone concerning something. Um, and we'll talk about the differences in just a moment. But um, if you have contract thinking in your relationship with God or the church or in a marriage relationship or just relationships, period, um, it can damage your relationships. It can be very damaging. Um, and let me tell you some differences, kind of the verses, contract, covenant. A contract is legally binding. Um, a covenant is, yes, legally binding, you could say, but also spiritually and physically binding. So there's a deeper element to a covenant. A contract is uh, conditional. It says, I'm, I'm committed to you if it benefits me. A covenant is guar a guaranteed commitment by unconditional an unconditional promise. And I know there's a lot more to it, but that unconditional promise or oath, and we see that in the nature of God. A contract can be terminated on the basis of incompetence, dissatisfaction, or if there's just a better offer or an upgrade comes along. You can laugh at that because you might have thought about marriage. And it's sad because you see what damage can be done in a marriage when you look at it as a contract. A covenant says if one party fails, the other party is long-suffering, reaches out, and continues to serve and love unconditionally. Contract says, a lot of you heard this many times before, I love you if, and then put after the if, whatever that is for you. Covenant says, I love you what? Period. Contract then seems to be temporal. Covenant, eternal. A contract is transactional. And we'll see this even more Covenant, as we look throughout the Bible, as we see in life, as we see how it should be, it seems to be more relational. I read a quote by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. I don't know much more about him, but this rabbi said in, in concerning these things, contracts benefit, but only, this is really interesting, but only covenants can transform. That's, a, that's really good to think about. Dig a little deeper maybe. In a covenant... 
two or more individuals, each re respecting the dignity and integrity of the other, come together in a bond of love and trust to share their interests, sometimes even to share their lives. You take that deeper with God and Jesus, and of course we see co covenant. By pledging their faithfulness to one another to do together what neither can achieve alone. And then he'll say what I read a moment ago. A contract is a transaction. A covenant is a relationship. Or to put it slightly differently, this was really good to think about. A contract is about interests. Mm -hmm. But a covenant is about identity. It is about you and me coming together to form an us. How that plays out with God, with marriage, with relationships with people and family, and wow, even church. Marriage should be a covenant, not a contract. So there's some more preaching. Gridley's heard this from me. A relationship with God is a covenant, not a contract. But what if... What if I treat my relationship with God, and you could say others too, as a contract? What happens then? The problem back in Hebrews is why we're looking at Hebrews, there was a problem. Because of persecution, and this matters for us today, there's a lot of similar type things, but because of persecution, abandonment, fear, the Jewish believers that this writer wrote this sermon to they became disillusioned, disoriented, afraid. They were, they were turning back to tradition, old priesthood, old covenant, sacrifices of animals to find some sort of security or comfort or an answer for their sin and shame. I don't know that it's much different today. If, if our relationship becomes contract thinking as far as relationship with God and others and the church, it's damaging. Even you could go as far as to say at times we're making covenants and contracts with culture because we think it will help us or provide something for us or give us safety. In the community, what, whatever it is. And God, throughout his word, said, do not make contracts like that with those around you. It won't work, and they will deceive you and trap you. And to think of this, the writer writes this sermon to the Hebrew Jewish believers in Jesus who are now, because of persecution and other things, suffering, running back in abandonment to what wasn't fully working, but they just don't know what else to do, and they're lonely and they're feeling threatened, and they're afraid. And the writer is constantly repeating himself, saying, don't do that. I think I have pleaded with you the times that I've talked in Hebrews with you, don't leave Jesus. Don't leave Jesus. Those other things aren't working for you. Yeah, you feel good for a minute, but it's, not satisfying. It is not the full life that you truly desire. And so the writer writes to them, and the same just call and cry to you today is, don't do it. No man, no law, no priest, no animal sacrifice, no old system can offer you security. None of that can get rid of your sin and shame. None of it. And none of it. And no one other than Jesus can offer you salvation. Why would you turn back? Why would you go back? The only one that can offer all of that is Jesus. How does this help me in my daily life today? Because I think, well, what does this matter for us today? And I was thinking through that and just started thinking about, it helps me when I'm tempted to keep the law instead of constantly going to God. There are times even in my relationship, maybe yours too, where I don't know 
how to fully explain it, but there are still times, even as a pastor who knows better, where I revert back to if I could just be a good boy with God, he will love me and I will get a better place in heaven. If I could just read my Bible more, if I could just pray better, if I gave more, if I went to church more, if I didn't sin so much, if I didn't do the same thing over and over again, if I could just be better, do better, then God will love me more. And that's me reverting back to law thinking, contract thinking. It also happens, and why this matters, when I'm tempted to go to a man or a leader or a perceived priest, someone instead of Jesus for forgiveness and salvation. My prayer as a pastor is not better than your prayer as a whatever you describe yourself as. You coming up to me after the service is me just joining with you, hopefully listening to you, praying with you and for you. But I am not a priest. I am not someone that you've got to walk into a booth and I'm going to tell you what to do and then you are forgiven and free. There is only one that can do that and his name is Jesus. That's it. I'll help you. But I go to the same Jesus you go to when I have to repent of my sin. When I am tempted to accept the temporary over something that God has offered me that's eternal, this helps me. Because sometimes I will take the temporary and make a bad choice or decision because I'll feel good for a moment. And I'll forget that that is not lasting and that God offers me something, this faithful God that we sung about. When I'm tempted to find my identity in what I do instead of whose I am in Jesus, this helps me. I think of covenant and how he feels about me. When I'm tempted to be righteous in my own works and strength, this helps me. When I'm tempted to find my love, acceptance, and forgiveness from God based upon my righteousness as well. There are still times when my mind, my heart is drawn back to how successful I was in doing things that made me feel better or I think gains God's approval. And so I feel like I told you earlier, like I need to do it more and more. And he'll like me better and better. He'll add to my mansion up there, wherever it's at. I'll get more bathrooms, bigger space. And all of that, I'll just tell you right now, leads to religious dysfunction and it's exhausting. God's story in Hebrews is awesome. Now, remember this. We'll look at some scripture. I'm going to then tell you a few things that you do out of this at the end. So what you hear between now and then for the next hour and a half, I'm always just checking, man. I mean, I'm capable, but you must look at Hebrews in the context of all of God's word. And then when we go to a couple chapters and then pull out some scriptures, look at it in the context of that book, that sermon as well. Never forget that, all right? So, because I'm going to pull some things out, we're going to talk about it, but you may have some deeper discussions. The author is repeating, and we're going to look at Hebrews 7 and 8, some portions there today. The author is repeating over and over the better and superior Jesus. He's better, he's more superior. He's better, he's more superior. And the moment I'm tempted to go to one of the things that I said, i got to go back and say, nope, Jesus is better. Ron, turn from that. He's better. Ah, I don't know. Nope, he's better. And I need, to be, <laughs> I need it repeated to me, and I need once in a while a little smack in the head to, to pull me back. And I need people in the church community to do the same. Don't come smack me in the head afterwards, all right? I had a great week. I was perfect. I, no. That's... 
contract thinking. So let me remind you of some things from Hebrews 7. These are some things of who Jesus is in 7 and 8. Number one, in your notes up on the screen, Jesus is our perfect priest. We've talked about Melchizedek. This is repeated over and over and over and over again. Before I get to the one for the screen, the slide, but think of this. Hebrews 7, 4 says, consider how great Melchizedek was. Jesus is even better than him. So this writer, this sermon writer, in, and this preacher is, is reminding the people all these stories they know. So when they hear Melchizedek, they go, I remember that guy from the stories of my ancestors. He was even better than Abraham, better than the high priest. And so when we consider him, when the writer says consider him, you, re- you realize he's saying Jesus is even better than him. Hebrews 7, 16 and 18 say, yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside. And listen to what he says. It's because it was weak and useless. Jesus is better than the priests. He's approved by God and he is superior to Melchizedek. So let me read you Hebrews 7, 24 through 27. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Thank you, Jesus. Therefore, 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 because of that, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. That means all my striving, though there are plenty of things to do for God, and I don't want to keep sinning, I must remember that there is nothing better than Jesus and what he's done. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. We'll mention that in a minute. He's the kind of high, this is so beautiful, he's the kind of high priest I need. Because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin, He's been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They'd have to do that constantly when you read the scriptures. They did this for their own sins and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus? But Jesus. But Jesus did this once for all. When he offered himself as the sacrifice for the people's sins. Wow. Wow. Jesus is our better high priest. He is the perfect priest. You don't need to go to anyone else. You go to him. And this means something. We'll come to it in the end. But this means this is who he is. And the writer is saying, constantly, you need to come back to him. Why are you going to some man or thing to get the forgiveness of sin? Two, Jesus is our better hope. There is something about hope that says, I can make it. When you are at your lowest, we believe with hope that he can bring us back up to his highest. Maybe not my highest, but his. Hope. Hebrews 7, 19 and 20 tell us more in this chapter who he is. Not only a priest, the perfect priest. For the law never made anything perfect. Never could. But now we have confidence. We can be assured in a better hope through which we can draw near to God. And this is a new system that God has presented. And it was established by a solemn oath and promise. Jesus offers a better hope through a new system, and through that we can draw near to God. We can have confidence that empowers me despite my situation and circumstances. That means I go to him as a priest, he offers me better hope, and I can come to and near to God because of him. So when I am at my lowest, it says that with confidence, I go to him in faith and hope that he can forgive me 
that he can transform my life, that he can change me, that he can use me despite what I've done, what the enemy has lied to me about, what others say about me. I wonder where and in who do you place your hope? Where do you place your hope? And a lot of us might say, Jesus. And yet at times, I find myself going back to things that I think can give me hope in the situation that I am in, especially when it's something where I'm suffering, I feel abandoned, I'm desperate, I'm persecuted, it's not working out. It could be a person, it could be money, things. Where and in who do you place your hope? And I will tell you this, Jesus is better. Jesus is better, always proven himself to me. And he does this by giving us, we'll come to this, a new and better covenant. We'll talk about the covenant in just a moment. But let me tell you this then. When you look at, at uh, Jesus as a high priest, the best high priest, Jesus as our better and greater hope. He is then these things in your notes, and we'll talk about this for a minute. A guarantor, he guarantees, and a mediator, because he mediates for us, of the better and new covenant. Hebrews 7.22. Because of this promise and oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. So God is saying all this over here, Jesus, it says, is sitting by him, and he is mediating between God and me. That's why I go to him. And he is guaranteeing it by certain things that he has done, his life, that it will happen. That's why I go to him as the priest. That's why I place my hope in him, because he's a guarantor and mediator of this better and new covenant. Hebrews 8.1, the writer writes and said, here's the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. And he is there, 8.6 then says, But now Jesus, our high priest, who's sitting on that throne, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. All right. So let me talk to you just for a minute about that covenant. All right. What does that mean? At least to the degree that we can cover it this morning. The writer in Hebrews is going to quote Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 in some of the scripture that we'll read in just a moment. And this hope that Jeremiah the prophet had hundreds of years earlier was fulfilled in Jesus. When we talk about a covenant that Jesus is there and this new covenant is for us, we don't go by the old system. We go to a new priest, Jesus. We have a better hope, Jesus. He's the guarantor and mediator of this new covenant. What is that? One of the things that I love following, if you don't, man, I would highly encourage always looking um, up and, and watching the videos from Bible Project. They are awesome. And um, there are cartoons, too, so I'm digging them. They say, and we read a little bit of this earlier about a covenant, is a relationship between two partners who make binding promises to each other and work together to reach a common goal. We talked about that with marriage, too. They're often accompanied by oaths, signs, promises, ceremonies. Covenants define obligations and commitments. But they are different from a contract because they are relational and personal. Jesus is that guarantor and mediator of this new, better covenant between man and God. The ministry of the Levitical priests that he is replacing, that was only temporary. It did not give access to God, or at least access to the real presence of God. This access was given by our perfect priest, Jesus. The old covenant, it was not sinful, but it was not sufficient. It was insufficient in what it could do. Hebrews says, we'll see this multiple times, that the old system was a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. Chapter 8 talks about that. 
It would reflect God's righteousness, but it could not fully produce righteousness. The old covenant, it could not provide the full abundant life that the new covenant, Jesus, promised when he was on earth in the Gospels, John 10, other places. It could reveal sin, temporarily cover sin and condemn us, but the old covenant never could fully cleanse, remove, and save us from our sin. This is why the author of Hebrews is constantly going, why are you abandoning Jesus? Why are you going to a different hope? Jesus has guaranteed and mediated this new covenant. Quit going back to the old thing. The old, it could easily deal with the outward for a temporary period of time. But the new, we'll read in just a moment, it dealt with the inward as well. The old covenant was a relationship through a priest. The new is a personal relationship with God. In the Old Covenant, we'll see this in a minute, you could know about God, but we're going to read. And we know from Jesus in the Gospels that because of Jesus, you can actually know God. And God wants to know you. They'd never experienced that before. And so he's constantly going, why would you go back? Old sins could be temporarily forgiven, but not forgotten. The new covenant says, your sin is forgiven, forgotten forever. Why would you go back? The the writer of Hebrews then says, Jesus himself is the guarantor of this better better than, this superior covenant. This is the only place in the New Testament where this is spoken of. He guaranteed that a, this Legal obligation would be carried out. This could lead even to risking his life for another. And we know ultimately he would surrender his life completely for our sin, for us. Jesus pledges himself as the guarantor and mediator. And he guarantees that this new covenant that God presents is permanent and it will never fail. And he offers a better hope, a new system, nearness to God, and then complete eternal salvation. And he's sitting on the throne, the Bible says, in many places right now, interceding for us, mediating for us. That's why I go to him. Why would you go to someone else? Some of the wording for that even means that, that Jesus, he keeps me linked Attached, connected to God. In a ministry that is not earthly, but it is heavenly. Why would you go to anything or anyone else for salvation, for life, for hope? Why would the readers and why would we consider trading away what Jesus has done for us? As if some ministry and tabernacle and place on earth could be better than a ministry and tabernacle in heaven. And so out of that, he offers something. All right? So I go to this high priest who offers me a better hope, cleansing of sin and salvation. And he mediates for me between God so that when I go to him and say this week, Jesus, I'm sorry. <sighs> sorry. Forgive me. And he mediates with the Father and says, Ron's here. And he reminds me, I love you. Thank you for coming to me. I see that sin. I've forgiven that sin. In fact, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection guarantee that it's taken care of forever, Ron. Ron, why would you go somewhere else? Why did you think that temporary feeling of whatever you're addicted to or whatever it is could, that will make you feel better for a minute? 
but it doesn't take care of your shame. In fact, it adds more, Ron. Why would you go back? Out of that, he offers these things. Hebrews 8, 10 through 13. So here's who he is. And here's what he offers us. And then I'll tell you a few things that I want you to do. But this is the new covenant. We just talked about it. That I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. You know what I'm going to do? This is a quote from Jeremiah 31. That is now fulfilled in Jesus. You know what I'll do, he says? What they longed for, I'll put my law in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. You know what? I'll be their God, and they will be my people. And you know what else? They will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone, for everyone, from the least to the greatest, will know me already. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. This is the new covenant. When God speaks of a new covenant, it means he has made the first one obsolete. So why would you go back to it? It is now out of date. And will soon disappear. Here's a few things that Jesus offers you. You can talk about this, think about it, dwell on it a little bit. One, it says that he offers you, when you come to him this way, based upon who he is, priest, hope, guarantor, mediator, he offers you a new mind. He changes the way you think. And he gives you a new way to think. Which drives how I live and love and worship. The scripture talks about that. I need often to change the way I think. My thinking sometimes drives me away and I need him. Hey, God, give me a new mind. My mind is corrupt and messed up. You know the things that I've seen and heard and done. I, knew a new, no, I need to know a new way to think. That comes from your word. Do we not need this today? Even people out there, they they don't, uh, maybe a lot of you in here, I don't know. They don't know what to think. What am I supposed to think about this? What's right? What's wrong? It sounds crazy, but you see the world today. Jesus offers you a new way to think, a new mind. The second thing is he offers you a new heart. It's the center of our whole being. Feelings, desires, physical, emotional, intellectual being, all of us. Jesus offers you a new heart. The new covenant involved the writing of God's laws on people's hearts. Remember, they used to have them on tablets of stone. God says that I'm going to place something in you and you're going to know. It's a fight, it's a battle, but you're going to know. And I'll give you a new heart. And these aspects are transformed lives. This is part of being transformed by Jesus and he is the only one that can do that. And then Jesus offers you a new relationship with God. He offers a real relationship over religious rules. It says all can know him. Remember it said everyone can know him. Not just one group. Not just one specific people. It says in there because he mediates for us and he guarantees these things. Remember it said earlier, I now have access to God. I do not have to go to a priest. You don't have to go to the pastor. You don't have to just find him at church in a building. We all can know him. We have access to him. And this is not knowing about him. This is actually truly knowing him. God revealed in Jesus. I love the book of Colossians. We taught it here once. 
one of the verses in chapter 1 says, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. Do you want to know God? The phrase is, then get to know Jesus. The other thing that he offers then that we read in the scripture there is he offers complete forgiveness of sin. Jesus is the perfect once and for all sacrifice. Why would you go back? There is no substitute or supplement for Jesus. Last week, Brent put my email up for a hard question. None of you emailed me. Good, because I didn't have the right answer. But I do want to address it for a moment in three minutes. The scripture said, for it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened. Those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit. Who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come and who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance by rejecting the Son of God. They themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. And some of you may leave and go, great. Uh, my men's group said, well, I guess I'm screwed. I don't know if that's a scriptural word or not, but it's all right. Or send me an email on that one, maybe. It's how it feels. You know how many times I've turned my back in, on God because of sin? A lot. 59, I got a lot of sin. But I'll probably have a bunch more too. But I'm not afraid of that verse. Hebrews speaks of it. It's, it's pretty plain. You go to Jesus, I just told you, he's the high priest. He's the great hope. He guarantees and mediates before the Father, my sin is taken care of. We read it forever when I go to him and ask for forgiveness. But why would I be afraid of this? If I say, I don't need Jesus, I can do it on my own. Then, of course, I should be afraid. If you are in that position right now, but you're here or watching online, I have one answer for you that is salvation. Run back to Jesus. Run back to Jesus. Yeah, but I left him. I've been trying to do it on my own, fix it on my own, take care of my own. I'm deep in the heart of sin, but I am just filled with shame and guilt. Get up, run back to Jesus, the mediator, the guarantor, who is sitting with the father and saying, our son and daughter has come home. Run back to Jesus. The author says it over and over again. Why would you go anywhere else? It does not work. Why does it say there's no hope for you? Because you left the only one that can take care of it. Am I too far? Run Back to Jesus. Have I done too much? Run back to Jesus. All right. Here's a few things you can do outside of running back to Jesus. <laughs> Every time I preach this, you're probably going to hear me the same thing, hear the same things over and over again. Run back to Jesus. He's better than anything else. All right. If this is all true about Jesus, who he is, what he, what he offers us, all right, here's what I think you should do. And there's tons more I'm sure you could put in here. But one, place all your hope in Jesus. He's the guarantor. Place all your hope in him. Place all your hope in him. I'm always reminded of John 15, 4 and 5. Remain in me and I'll remain in you, Jesus says. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. That's Hebrews. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. And he says, I'm the vine, you're a branch, Ron. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Place all your hope in Jesus too. 
This is the biggie. This is the biggie. Confess all your sin to Jesus. Confess all your sin to Jesus. Live by this new system. You don't go to a priest. You don't a- a- offer a sacrifice except yourself. Live by the new covenant because Jesus is your mediator. I was sharing with some of the folks, do you remember that story? I've shared it here with you before, a little more emotional and, uh, and, and tried to be a little more visual. But I am just enthralled by this story when Jesus encounters Peter right before he's going to go, Jesus is going to go to his death. And he'll t- he tells Peter, hey, Peter, I want to talk to you for a minute. Come here. You're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, I'll never do that. I'll never do it. I would never do that. And I know, you're going to do it three times. I'll never do it. I'd never do that. How many of us have said that before? I'd never do that. And yet, there you find yourselves in the dip, the depth of darkness. I'll never do it. And, G- and Jesus tells him, well, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Like he knows. <laughs> he knows what he's going to do already. But he says, this great intercessor, the mediator, the guarantor, our hope, our high priest, says to Peter, ah, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, Peter, but I'm praying for you. I'm interceding for you. When you come back, encourage the brothers. And then there's this, the whole story afterwards. Man, confess all your sin to Jesus. He is interceding for you. His work is finished and final. We don't need substitute supplements, as I told you earlier. Man, you want to read some good stuff on this connected to Hebrews? I'm not going to do it. But Galatians 2 and 3, man, read it later on. But 1 John 1, 9, it's a very popular verse, easy to memorize. But if we confess our sins to him, Jesus, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. That's why I go to him. My cleansing doesn't work. And the last one is this. Worship team, come on up. Come confidently close to Jesus. It says that we can draw near to God through him. Not your own righteousness. James 4, 8. Come close to God and God will come close to you. And then he says, connected to the previous instructions for you to do, that confession piece, wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. He recognizes what we're going to do, but he offered the great sacrifice, his son Jesus, for our sin. That's why I can come confidently close to him. That's why I can have a relationship with him. Because, Jesus, thank you for being our high priest. I've tried other men and people and things to get forgiveness, to work it out, to help me. Nothing is greater than you. Thank you, Jesus, for being our great hope. I've placed my hope in possessions and money and people so many times, and they have not proven to get rid of all the shame and guilt and sin in my life or give me the full life that I desire in my heart. And thank you that by the sacrifice of your life, you are guaranteeing the things that you have done and who you are. And you mediate for us between the Father. So I run to you, Jesus. I run to you. And even when temporarily I run away, I am reminded by good people, your word, your Holy Spirit working, that come home, run back to me. And I pray today if there is someone here that they will realize these things of who you are and then what you have to offer. Forgiveness of sin. Getting rid of shame, a real relationship, a new mind, a new heart. You offer these things to us. So we come today in a place where healing starts, revival starts, transformation starts and confessing all of our sin to you. 
placing all our hope in you. And because of who you are and what you offer, we can come confidently before you. And you, with open arms, receive us with love and grace because of your covenant. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand with me, let's worship. If you need prayer, I'll be down here for a minute. Others will be up here. Terry's right there. And let us pray with you. Prayer afterwards. Let's sing this song. If you got some communion, take it. I want to come back up and give you a blessing. But I want to remind you, Philippians 4.13 says these words. I can do everything through Christ because of who he is and what he offers, who gives me strength. Thank you, Jesus.